Okay, so in today's lecture we're going over assignment two. And what I'm going to do first is just give a demo and show off some of the features of the assignment. Then I'll draw some stuff talking about circles, which this assignment uses a lot of circles. And then I'll, I got a couple of slides, and then we'll go over the readme file and the code and et cetera, et cetera. So that'll be pretty much the same for all the assignments. So ha let's have a look at the uh, solution here. I'm going to turn off the, the enemy spawning. So this game is a Geometry Wars clone. Sorry if you're in person here, it might be a little bit dark. There's actually like a checkerboard pattern on the back, but you can't see that because the projector doesn't have enough dark color fidelity or something. But, um, has anyone played Geometry Wars or heard of it or seen it? So it's just a basic shooter game where I, with my W, A, S, and D keys, are controlling, I'm controlling this uh, rotating octagon here. And if I click somewhere, you see that it shoots a bullet, and that bullet goes a certain amount of distance before it disappears. If I shoot an enemy, it's going to explode into little enemies, and the number of little enemies is equal to the number of sides that that polygon has. So this triangle should explode into three things. This one should explode into, uh, well, when I get it behind the UI, this one should explode into six things, if I can actually hit it. There we go. And that's pretty much it. If you get hit, you go back to the start, and then there's some score. And so what I've done over here is I've made it pretty uninteresting because I've turned off the automatic spawning of enemies. But what's going to happen is every this number of frames, uh, a new enemy is going to spawn. And your job is to like stay alive and, uh, and kill as many things as you can. And then you get a score, and that score is a function of the number of sides of things, and I'll talk about that, but the score is listed up here. So this is pretty much the whole assignment. Um, now, that being said, it takes about 30 seconds to describe the game to a person who wants to know how to play it. But the actual you know, uh, design document of the game and the coding spec is a little bit long. Because there's a lot of things going on under the hood here that may not seem um, really obvious at first. So uh, let me click over here. You've got a UI that you're going to write as well. Um, so you can turn off the movement, for example. Um, you can turn off the lifespan. You can turn off collisions so I no longer die when something hits me. Uh, I can manually spawn a bunch of things over here. I can turn off the rendering. Well, that broke things. Maybe I shouldn't have a rendering button because um, do as I say, not as I do. So yours shouldn't crash when that happens. I made a bunch of changes to the code last night to refactor it. and. I haven't fully tested it yet, but that won't crash when you get it. Over here we have an entity manager, so you can see all the different things in the entity manager in the UI over here, so I can scroll down. And then something I can, I can do, which is pretty neat, um, for debugging purposes at least, let me turn off the spawning and I'll turn off the movement for now. I can come over here to all the entities and I can just start deleting them. Right? So I can, like, this is great for debugging to see if everything works. Um, and then if I turn back on the spawner, when things spawn, they could, they're added here. I can see the player. I can see uh, if I shoot something, then there's some small ones. But I've turned off the movement, so none of my bullets are moving. So, so that's the demo of the assignment. Okay, so that's what the assignment is uh, in just simple description. Before, uh, actually, let me open up the PowerPoint slides next to give you some more. OK, so holding that button brings up a list of emojis. You can do it, PowerPoint. There we go. So I'm just going to go over a little bit of the architecture of the assignment so that you know what's changed for the fir from the first assignment, etc. So in assignment one, that was basically just getting used to C++ and um, the APIs of SFML and IMGUI, et cetera. And all of the functionality of assignment one was just in one file. It was all in main.cpp. And as your programs get bigger and bigger, we're going to see that you, know, you get more files, you get more classes, more, more structures for managing the data, et cetera. So in assignment two, um, there's a separation of functionality into classes. So we'll have different classes that do different things. Um, we're going to write our own VEC2 class to do this uh, 2D game math. We talked about that a bit last time. We see all the different classes related to ECS, so we have components and entities, etc. 
We have an entity manager, which is going to handle all of our entity data. And we have ECS systems um, inside our game class that are going to handle all of the game mechanics. So we're separating things quite nicely in assignment two into individual components. And the overall architecture is going to look like this. So we've got this game engine object. So in, in our uh, assignment two, this is just going to be called the game class. So the game class handles everything. That class is going to have some systems. Those systems are just functions. So we're just going to call those functions to do things like handle the movement, handle the lifespan, etc. cetera. Uh, it's also going to have an entity manager. And the entity manager is going to store and handle all of the entity objects. And the entities are going to store all of the component objects. And so this is basically the architecture for assignment two. <clears throat> I've got some roughly drawn UML diagrams here. Um, so components. In this uh, assignment, we've got a transform component. It's got things like position, velocity, scale, angle. We've got a collision component. And so things are going to be colliding based on their radius because they're circles with a position and a radius. Uh, things are going to have a score component. And what we're going to do is when you kill something with a bullet, it's going to add the score component of that uh, entity to your total score. We have a shape component and that's just going to have an SF circle shape. This is actually circle shape, but I didn't have enough uh, room to type circle shape on the slide. Uh, I've got a lifespan component and I'll talk about that in a bit. And I've also got an input component that we attach to the player and anything that has an input component is going to be controlled by the mouse and keyboard. So the components are pure data. Uh, as we saw last time, they are stored within the entity class and each component is its own class which uh, inherits from this base component type class. Entities, uh, over here we've got a brief overview, not every single thing uh, in the entity, but most of it. So an entity again is anything in the game. So in that example that we just showed, uh, the entities would be the player, they would be any of the bullets that you fired, any of the enemies or the small en en enemies, etc. And this is going to store this component tuple. Again, I just called it C tuple. Uh, for brevity for the slide. We've got this alive bool. We've got a tag. This is sort of the type of entity. So whenever I spawn an enemy, I'm going to say, hey, this is enemy. And so then I can tell the entity manager, give me all the enemies. Or when I spawn a bullet, I can give it the tag of bullet. And then I can say, hey, entity manager, give me all the bullets. Um, uh, alive or dead. So if alive is true, it's alive. If it's um, if it's not true, then it's dead, and the entity manager will destroy it on the next frame. The ID is this integer identifier. So for example, let's say that we have a loop in the game. Let's, say just, let's just say that ent enemies collided with each other, right? If we had that as a game mechanic. So we would loop over all the enemies, and then within that loop, we would again loop over all the enemies to see if enemy number one in the outer loop is colliding with enemy number two in the inner loop. But of course, if that's all we did, we would be checking every entity against itself, right? And so they would always say, oh, hey, I'm definitely colliding with myself. And so what we can do to check to see if it's literally the same entity is to check the IDs. Because we know that if entities have the same ID, then they are literally the same entity. So that's what that ID is there for. We have the entity manager. I won't get into all of this other than to say that whenever I say SP here, that's just a shared pointer. It saves me, you know, space on the slide. Uh, entity vec, this is going to be a standard vector of standard shared pointers um, for this assignment. So this is our entity factory class. We implement this delayed entity add and delayed entity removal um, for purposes of avoiding iterator invalidation. We also have this secondary map, so I call this an entity map. This is actually a map from strings to entity vectors, as we saw last time. And what we're doing here is we're, we're trading a little bit of storage for a lot of convenience. And then we can do other bookkeeping, like memory management, et cetera, if we want to inside the, the entity manager. The first real new class uh, that you haven't seen before is this game class. And so this is going to store a number of, uh, of variables here. It's the top level game object. Uh, it holds all the game data, it has all the game systems and functionality, it has all the gameplay code. And so, for example, uh, over here in this UML, a minus means it's a private um, scope. 
and a plus means it's a public scope. So we've got things like an initialization function. This is where you set up the window, etc. We've got an update function. This is going to be the thing that's called every frame. Um, we've got systems here, so we've got a movement system, a user input system, an enemy spawner system, a collision system, rendering system. Um, we can say whether or not the game is paused, uh, whether or not the game is still running, etc. So that's the game class. And of course, I'll go scroll through all this code and, and uh, uh, at the end of the lecture, or a little bit later. We're going to have this VEC2 um, class which is, uh, we talked about that already, it's, uh, it's going to store an X and a Y, so a VEC2 is essentially a point in space, or if you want to think about it in terms of linear algebra, it's a vector from the origin to a point in space. It's going to have a number of uh, functions on it that will be really convenient for us, so I've just kind of said dot 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 here, there's about a dozen functions that we're going to have to write for this assignment, and um, so what I've given you as a starting point is I've given you the skeleton code uh, in the header file, and what you have to do is just implement that. So there's a, it's a bit of typing, but in future assignments, I'll just give you the completed VEC2 class. You won't have to rewrite all of that. I just want you to write it once just to see, oh, this is how operator overloading works. This is how I add functions and stuff. This is a templated class. So what that means is that um, whenever we declare a VEC2, we're going to have to declare what type we want to store, right? So I could have a VEC2 where I have X and Y as ints or floats or doubles, or anything else really. But, you know, primitive data types are the only thing that really makes sense here. And so to save us a little bit of typing in the assignment, we're gonna have using vec2f equals vec2float. So what that will do is whenever you type vec2f, it, can, it uh, creates a vec2 of floats. And since SFML typically deals with floats, that's what we're gonna be using. It's just a vec2f. So vec2f, that is our, just like um, SF, vector 2f. It's our own implementation of that class. So what can this game engine actually do? Uh, it can create game objects as entity instances. It can add component data to entities. It can implement the gameplay via systems and handle user input. It can pause and play and exit the game. It can uh, initialize itself by loading data from a configuration file. And so this is what's going to happen um, with this version of the game engine. What are some of the limitations of Assignment 2's version of the game engine? We can only really display one scene, right? So you just start the game and you're immediately playing it. In the future, we'll have a menu where you can select from different things. Uh, it currently cannot load any texture or sound assets. Now, I say that it can't do it. You could, of course, program that in there, right? You could just say, hey, load this thing. But what we'll do in the future is we'll actually have an asset manager that will load sounds and load textures in a really nice way, um, similar to the entity manager, but we can't do that out of the box with the game engine just yet. And so it cannot display textured animations or bitmap animations that we'll talk about in the next assignment. It doesn't have any menu or interface. And uh, uh, just to talk about game scenes for a little bit, uh, a game can contain many different scenes. So for example, over here, you might have a dialogue scene in Pokemon. Um, you might have a world map scene where you're walking around the map. You might have a battle scene. And so this is just the example um, from Pokemon. And how can we change our architecture to, uh, to actually incorporate these different scenes? Well, you're just going to have to stay tuned until uh, assignment three to figure that out. We'll put something in the game engine. So any questions at all about the architecture so far? It's pretty basic. Um, it's pretty intuitive, I think. I don't think you should have any problems um, figuring that out. So those are the slides. Um, the next thing that I want to do real quick is just talk about um, circles in SFML because this is going to be all about the circles. So again, just to review, uh, a circle shape, uh, this is a circle, right? Or is it? Well, it turns out that this is an oval because that's what this particular paint program draws but I'm going to try and make them as close to circles as I can. So if I happen to draw an oval here, that's a skill issue. Just pretend that it's a circle, okay? Um, so this is a circle. In SFML, we can define an SF circle shape, luckily, and just draw it to the screen. Really, really simple. Of course, as I mentioned before, a circle on a, like any circle that exists in nature or in simulation is not really a circle. Right? This is a sort of illusion of a circle, because a mathematical circle 
is defined as the infinite set of points that are equidistant from a radius. And there are, you know, a, a finite set of points there. And so if we zoomed in far enough, we could find space between the pixels. And so it's not really a circle. But what it is, is a number of straight lines that SFML has drawn to make it look like a circle. And so what we can do in SFML whenever we draw a circle shape, we give it a point count or an edge count, right? And so if we tell SFML to draw a circle with a point count of three, this is what we get. We get a triangle. If we tell it to draw a circle with a point count of four, this is what we get. Because it's trying to draw them along the radius, or sorry, along the circumference of the circle, but if there aren't enough to make it look like a circle, it's just drawing uh, a regular polygon, essentially, with that many vertices. And so this is essentially how you are going to create those different shapes in assignment two. They're all circles. Every single thing you're doing in this is circles. For example, the player, I've said that's gonna, the player's gonna have eight sides. And all the enemies that are spawning are going to have a random number of sides between, what's the minimum number of sides we can have? Three. Three, right? Because if it was two, it would be a line. The maximum number is going to be some number that I tell you. Maybe it's eight, maybe it's ten. But whenever you go to spawn an enemy every so many frames, that, that again is in the configuration file, you're going to give it um, uh, a number of sides, let's say, randomly between three and eight. And so that's what will create the variety uh, of things. Now, one thing that's going to happen in this assignment is you're going to have a circle. Let's say this is the player and this is uh, an enemy, right? So these things are going to collide when those two circles overlap. So this will be a collision, right? At some point, it'll move a bit. And so moving in, in a video game is not some smooth, continuous thing, right? We're going to have some speed and then let's say our speed is five, it's going to instantaneously move over by five pixels, one frame, and then five pixels, another frame, then five pixels, another frame, then another one, then another one. And at some point we have some amount of overlap, right? And at the point at which we have a non-zero overlap, and we talked about that last time, it's when the distance between the midpoints is less than the sum of the radius of both of the circles, right? So this will be considered a collision. Now, if you've been sort of paying attention, you might say, okay, what about in this case, right? So I have a pentagon or, you know, a triangle or whatever, however many sides. How does this collide? Am I going to have to like individually calculate when a circle like overlaps with this line or whatever? No, we're not doing that in this assignment. We're just going to do the easiest possible thing of where... Um, let me copy this and paste it. Okay, so what we are going to do is just say whenever the circumcircle, which is the circle that is the smallest circle that encapsulates our object, intersects with the circumcircle of the other object, that is when a collision happens. So you can see here that there is an error. Right? We are not actually dealing with pentagons here. We are dealing with circles that look like pentagons. And so this will be when the collision occurs, not when the actual sides... And But when you're playing this game, it doesn't matter what's actually happening. What, what matters is what the user thinks is happening. And it's going by so fast that you don't even really notice that this is happening. Okay, So that's what we're doing in this assignment. We have two... Um, SF circle shapes that each have a midpoint. That is the worst midpoint ever. Um, let me go back to black here. So that's the midpoint. This is the midpoint. And we have a radius from, uh, as the collision, um, the collision component. And so we're using this radius right here and this radius right here. And if the sum of those two is greater than this distance, then there's a collision. So I just wanted to show you that, yes, it does result in two shapes that are not perfect circles overlapping when maybe they shouldn't, but it's just, you know, game programming does this all the time. We're not interested in the exact physics. We're interested with the good enough physics that will make our game work. Uh, also, just a quick note, 
in case you didn't pick this up from assignment one. Um, there's a couple of different properties that we will be using in, I have never used this new version of, of paint in Windows 11, so I'm trying to find the paint bucket here. Is that the paint bucket? Let's see. Okay, so there's a couple of different properties. Um, the first property is the line that draws the circle. That is the outline color. So the outline color and the outline thickness determine the look of the outline of the circle shape. And then there is a fill color as well. So if I were to describe this, this circle has a fill color of red, an outline color of black, and it has a thickness of about three or four pixels, an outline thickness of about three or four pixels. It is possible to have the outline color and the fill color be the exact same thing, but that looks not as nice. And so what we're doing in this assignment is we have, um, I think it's an outline color of white, or I, I've described it in the README file, but I just wanted to show you that. Uh, one last thing that's going to happen in the assignment, and I'll just show it now rather than tab back and forth, is that when, let's say this is the enemy, and when an enemy explodes, when, it, when it's hit by a bullet or hit by the player, uh, the enemy has a midpoint here. I'm going to try and draw that midpoint. That's approximately a midpoint, right? Okay. So what's going to happen is, when this enemy dies, it spawns a number of small enemies with something like half the radius of this enemy, with the same colors, that explode in angles outward from the center. So the way that's going to work is that, and I've described this in the readme, I just want to show it here. If it has five sides, then what's going to happen is, let me just draw this. You're going to chop up this 360 degree circle into an equal, or sorry, five angles, so 360 divided by five, whatever that is, that is this angle right here. And then what you have to do is calculate the velocity vector. So they're all going to spawn right in the middle here. But you have to calculate the velocity vector so that the things go out in this like explosion radius. And the line that you want to follow is this one. So you can just take 360, and, and if this is rotated, a bit like if this line instead of going here it actually goes like out like this I don't mind if the if the smaller enemies don't follow the vertices exactly but what it should do is you divide 360 by the number of sides and then what do you have well you have a speed that I've given you and you have an angle and you have to find the velocity vector and we have a slide on that from the last lecture okay so that's what I mean when I say whenever an enemy dies it explodes into n smaller enemies uh, that are like equally radial about the center of that. That's, that's what that means. And let's just give one small demo of that uh, before I get into the code. So what happens here if I turn off the spawning, there we go, and I turn off, I can't turn off the movement, but if I hit this, you can see that it explodes out like that. So this one should have three, and so they're half the size, the same color, and there are as many of them as there are sides to the, to the original circle. Okay, so let's go through the README file, and I'll show you how such a simple game can be very, very long when you try and describe it exactly. Okay, so the first part here is exactly the same as the other one. Except, when you are submitting this assignment, there are multiple files that you're going to be editing. So what I want you to do is just right-click and zip the source directory and upload that to D2L. So try not to put the source directory into any other directories. Don't zip the whole directory. Please, just the source directory. And we're going to take off 2 or 3% if that's not if that's not done properly. So just right click, if you're on Windows, right click source, add to archive or whatever, just create a zip file of that. Okay, program specification. So in this assignment, you'll be writing a game that was presented in class. Um, this game must have the following features. So first we have the player. 
The player is represented by a shape which is defined in the config file. Uh, later, at the bottom, I'm going to go through the entire config file specification. So I won't look at that yet. We'll uh, look at that in a bit. The player must spawn in the center of the screen at the beginning of the game and after it dies. And the only way that the player can die is uh, if it touches an enemy. So if it does, there's no lives or anything in this one. We're just detecting it and we're spawning the player right back in the middle of the screen. Uh, one little tip for this is make sure that at any time there's only one active player. Because if you have a spawn player function and that creates a new player, then if it dies, you gotta, you gotta correctly remove it before adding the player. So just make sure that you don't have multiple players when you spawn a new one. Uh, the player moves by a speed read from the configuration file in these directions. Up is the W key, left is A, so it's standard WASD controls for up, down, left, and right. The player is confined to move only within the bounds of the window. Let me just uh, do this real quick for you. So if I move all the way over here, I'm holding left, I'm holding left, I can't move outside the bounds of the window. I'm holding down, I'm holding down, so I can't, I can't escape the window. Uh, the player will shoot a bullet toward the mouse pointer when the left mouse button is clicked. The speed, size, and lifespan of the bullets are read from the configuration file. And so again, uh, if I run this real quick, you can see that if I, let me turn off the spawning, if I shoot over here, I shoot a bullet, and something else is going to happen, is that anything that has a lifespan, you're going to alter the alpha channel to correspond to its lifespan. So this is just a neat little feature where any, see these things that had a lifespan? They, uh, let me do that once more. The small enemies do not last forever. They have a lifespan. And so you're going to have, in your lifespan system, you're going to detect, to detect the lifespan of something and set its alpha part of its color accordingly so that it fades out slowly to time it so that as soon as the object becomes completely transparent, it's destroyed. So that's one other thing that we're doing. You can see the bullets here uh, follow the same structure. Special ability. Oh, I forgot the special ability. You are free to come, on, come up with your own special move, which is fired by the player when the right mouse button is clicked. Sorry, Mac users, you might have to use a mouse for this one. This ability must, um, it have, must have multiple entities, so multiple bullets or whatever mechanic you come up with, multiple things must be fired. Um, the entities that it fires must have some unique graphic associated with them. Uh, a unique game mechanic is introduced by a new component, so you are going to add a new component um, to the entity class to do this. And a cooldown timer must be implemented so that you can't just spam this special weapon. So you've got to add something, maybe a component, which is a cooldown, etc., that says, okay, I can only fire this special ability once every two seconds or something like that. Um, the properties of the special move will not be present in the configuration file because I don't want to receive 40 different configuration files. We're just going to run it with our configuration file. So by special move, I have coded a, just a sample special move. And if I right click, it fires a bunch of bullets like this. Um, I can't zoom in on that, but mine doesn't have a cooldown. Yours should have a cooldown. And if I set a bunch of things to spawn really quickly here, I'm going to turn down the spawn timer. You know, my special weapon is pretty overpowered. I can just spam it here and, and kill everything. But I have seen so many different cool special weapons submitted. Um, I think one of my favorites was like a flamethrower. So you held down the right mouse button. And what happened was uh, it like shot out things that looked like fire. Like so it would shoot out and they'd be sort of randomized how they moved. And then you had fuel. And so your fuel would run out as you were holding down the right mouse button and you had to wait for your fuel to fill up before you could start shooting it again. So that is a perfectly valid one. I have seen people put in screen shaking effects. There was like an earthquake where it would like, you know, deal damage to everything and then the screen would shake. It's all, it's up to you how you implement that special weapon. And I think there's like 10% of the assignment mark is devoted to that special weapon. Now, as, as long as you meet the criteria that I've specified in the readme file, you're gonna get full marks. But it's pretty cool to like to play around with it and, and see what you can implement. Enemies. Enemies will spawn in a random location on the screen every X frames where X is defined in the configuration file. 
So X is defined in the config file, but you're also going to have it in the UI. Enemies must not overlap the sides of the screen at the time of spawn. What does that mean? It means the following. Uh, can I just hit new here? Don't save. So if this here is the screen, and this is an enemy, it has to spawn completely within the bounds of the screen. So you can't spawn it here. Okay, you can't spawn it here. For example, you can't spawn it here. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to figure out, okay, what is the minimum... Uh, if I draw another circle, or another rectangle, so let's say the enemy has a specific radius like this, then this is really the bounds of where you can spawn it, right? So if I have an enemy uh, which has this radius, then you can see here that the midpoint where I spawn this thing is going to be this. Oh, and I forgot to say that uh, in this assignment, the midpoint of the circle is where the position is going to represent. And I'll show you how that's done once we get to the component part. But the positions of everything are going to be the midpoints of them. So the midpoint of the bullet, the midpoint of the player, and the midpoint of the enemies. Because if you have like your position up here, right, which we had in assignment one, it's very difficult to calculate collisions if you're not using the midpoint and the radius. So we just said the midpoint to everything. So that's what that's going to mean, is that you have to spawn things um, within the bounds of the um, of the game arena. Enemy shapes have a random number of vertices between a minimum and maximum number, which is specified in the config file. Enemy shape radius will be specified in the config file. Enemies will be given a random color upon spawning. So you've got an R, G, and B for your color. Each of those is just going to be a random number between 0 and 255 to generate a random color. Enemies will be given a random speed upon spawning between a minimum and maximum value specified in the config file. When an enemy reaches the edge of the window, it should bounce off in the opposite direction at the same speed. So that's just like assignment one. So you've already done something like that. Here's the maybe the most complex part of this whole assignment. When large enemies collide with a bullet or a player, they are destroyed and n small enemies spawn in its place where n is the number of vertices of the original enemy. Each small enemy must have the same number of vertices and color of the original enemy. These small entities travel outwards at angles at fixed intervals equal to 360 divided by vertices degrees. So we talked about that already. Um, so for example, if the original enemy had six sides, the six smaller enemies will travel outward in intervals of 60 degrees each, out from the center of that original enemy. Score. Each time an enemy spawns, it should be given a score component of n times 100, where n is the number of vertices it has, and small enemies are given double that value, because it's a little harder to, to hit them. If a bullet kills an enemy, the game score is increased by the score component of the enemy killed. That's pretty easy. The score should be displayed with a font specified in the config file in the top left corner of the screen. Drawing. In the rendering system, all entities should be given a slow rotation, which makes the game look a little bit nicer. And so, you know, you just, uh, every shape entity has a rotation component. You can just rotate that. Um, I'll show you how to do that once we get to the code. Any special effects which do not alter gameplay can be added for up to 5% bonus on the assignment. Note that the assignment cannot go over 100 marks, but the 5% bonus can be made up other loss marks. So if you want to put in any sort of special effects above and beyond what I've said, you can get bonus marks for that. Um, any entity with a lifespan is currently alive. Uh, or, sorry, what? Any entity with a lifespan, that should say that is currently alive, should have its color alpha channel set to a ratio depending on how long it has left to live. For example, if an entity has 80 frame lifespan total, and 25 frames remaining, its alpha channel should be set to 25 divided by 80 times 255. The alpha should go from 255 when it's first spawned to zero on the last frame that it's alive. And what this does is it's just a visual indicator of the amount of time that this thing has left to live. Okay? The GUI. Now you can see how, like, how long this is. We're about halfway through. And so a very simple game 
when explained explicitly in text. You know, these game design documents are important because if you're working on this game with a group or with a team, you know, and you, you have some like, oh, did he mean this or did he mean that? Or did she do like, what did she want to do over here? Well, it's all the document, right? So you can refer to the document. So the document is long, but it's not, it's, it's almost more work to write the document than it is to write the code. So don't worry too much. Uh, of course, we're using IAM GUI. You must construct a GUI using IAM GUI with the following functionality. Um, you must have an option to disable each system independently. And that should not crash the system like my solution code just did, which I will fix tonight. Don't make um, a bunch of changes right before release day. That's the, that's the, uh, the lesson there. For each entity in the game, the GUI, the GUI must list the ID, tag, and position of that entity. You must display a list of all entities, as well as lists of entities by their tag. You must also have some way of destroying a given entity by interacting with the UI element associated with it. So I've already showed that, but let me just show it again real quick. Uh, over here, I have an entity manager. I can show all the entities right here like this. Or I can show entities by tag up here. So you've just got to make something. It doesn't have to look exactly like this. But what does have to happen is you have to have a little button here. Mine just says D for destroy. And if I click one, it will delete or destroy the associated entity with that. So what you're going to have to do is just come up with some way of doing that. Uh, doesn't have to be, doesn't have to look the exact same as what I've done. Yep. What happens if you try to boot and there's no player? Oh, well, I've destroyed the player. Um, you shouldn't do that because I've destroyed it via the GUI, which has no backup system um, in the code itself. So you don't need to handle that case. Just don't destroy the player. There we go. Okay, so that's what happens if you destroy the player. My code did not handle that because it didn't look at things that are destroyed via the GUI. So your code, it, if don't delete the player. It's, it's fine if your code doesn't handle, handle the deletion of the player. That's a really good question. So that's what that means. You must be able to change the enemy spawn interval via the UI. You must be able to manually spawn enemies in some way via the UI. You may develop the UI in any way that contains this functionality, but it must be easily usable and clearly presented to get full marks, right? So don't have like a bunch of submenus within submenus, then we had need a PhD to like figure it out. So just, just make it as clear as possible. What I would recommend is just try and copy mine as, as much as you can. Uh, miscellaneous, the P, she, the P key should pause the game. The escape key should close the game. Let me see if I've implemented those properly. So let's spawn a bunch of enemies. If I press the P key, it pauses the game. So everything stops, even the lifespan, right? So that's important as well. Uh, P key should re resume the game. So one mistake that is very easy to make is that when you pause the game, uh, now, if I unpause the game, maybe all of those entities die because it's been a while since they spawned. So you just got to make sure that when the game is paused, the lifespan is not ticking down, right? That's one thing that you should do. And then, so you can unpause the game like that. And if you hit the escape key, it's going to close the game. One thing that I am still not sure of, and I, this is really annoying, but in Mac, uh, there's some weird thing in SFML, and I know how to fix it, but I didn't want to put the code in because it's confusing. But if I hit a mod key, like Alt, Shift, Command, or something on the Mac for some reason, it just crashes. And I'm, I'm not 100% sure why that is, but it does, so I apologize. Just don't hit Control, Alt, or Shift, or anything like that, because um, by default, it, <laughs> it will crash it. And so you can put in some code that handles this things, but I just didn't want to have it there. I just want to tell you that that's not your fault. That's SFML's fault. All right, the config file. Um, the configuration file will have one line per thing, so it's very similar to the first one. The first one is window. This declares that the SFML window must be constructed with width W, height H. Each of those will be integers. FL is the frame limit that the window should be set to. And fs is an integer which specifies whether to display the application in full screen mode, so that's a 1, or not with a 0. 
Um, I am not going to demonstrate full screen mode with the solution because I think it will mess up my OBS recording if I change the resolutions. So that's why I'm not displaying it, but it should uh, be full screen if that's a one and not if it's a zero. So if we go over um, to the config file, you can see here, okay, window 1920 by 1080, uh, 60 frames per second, and it is not full screen. So that's what's uh, being displayed here. Next is the player specification, and there's a bunch of stuff, okay? So you gotta read in a bunch of stuff. Uh, first, we have the shape radius. So that's the radius of the circle that will represent the player. We have the collision radius. And you might say, why is the collision radius different than the shape radius? This will be a little bit more obvious when we do uh, future assignments that have textures and stuff, but it could mean that, let's say, for example, you want to make the game a little bit easier for the player. If so, then you could draw the player big, but maybe you'll allow a little bit of overlap with the enemies, right? So you can, you can have the collision radius be smaller than the actual displayed radius of the player. You have the speed, which is uh, speed S. Now, one thing to keep in mind for the assignment is the following. Let's say I have the player here, and I have the W, A, S, and D keys, right? To move up, down, left, and right. So if I'm moving up, let's say my speed is 10. If I'm holding up, then at, on each successive frame, essentially, I'm going to be changing the Y position to go down by 10, right? So that's, that's holding up. That's what's happening. Uh, similarly, if I'm holding right and my speed is 10, then I'm adding 10 to the X on every frame. But here's the tricky part. If I'm holding W and D, what should not happen is that it should not increase the X and the Y by 10. Because, and this is present in a lot of games, especially older games, when I'm going up and I'm going to the side, it's called strafe running, right? Strafe running is faster than normal running in some games because of lazy programmers, right? Why? Well, because I've got a 45 degree angle, and so the square root of two times 10 is actually how fast I'll be going. So I'll be going like 12 point something um, instead of 10 speed. So what I want to happen here is that if you are holding up, so if you're going diagonally, I want the length of that to be 10, right? So you've got to figure that out. And we did exactly that in the lecture last time where you have to normalize it and then multiply it by 10. Okay, so you just have to have something in there that detects that. Uh, okay, next is the fill color and the outline color. Those are two RGBs, that's pretty easy. The outline thickness and the shape vertices of the player. So over here we have player uh, 32, 30, well, okay, what is all this? Uh, shape radius and collision radius, so the player is 32 and 32. Then we have uh, speed, which is five, so we're gonna be moving five each time. Then I have the fill color, which apparently is a dark gray 555. I have the outline color, which is 25500, which is red. Then I have, what was that one? Uh, the outline thickness, which is four, and then the number of vertices, which is eight. So let's just say I have some crazy big uh, thing, and now I change this to three. If I've done the solution correctly, then we should... <laughs> We should have this massive, but you see the collision radius is still 32, right? So this is not, this is not ideal, but it just shows you that, you know, if you do this, then the game designer, not the game programmer, but the game designer can go back and, um, and change these values to, to balance the game or whatever with playtesting. Next, we have the enemy specification. And the enemy specification is pretty much the same up until this point, right? at which it gives you uh, the min and max vertices. So if it's 3, 10, then that means that the minimum number of vertices is 3, the max is 10, so whenever you spawn an enemy, you have to uh, generate a random number between those two. Uh, the small lifespan, that is the lifespan in frames of the small enemy, and this is the spawn interval of the regular enemies. So over here, for example, by default, uh, 
Uh, the lifespan of a small enemy is 90, so at 60 frames per second, the small enemies will last for a second and a half before they disappear. And the spawn interval is 60 by default, meaning that they will spawn one per second. And the bullet specification, again, is the same up to here. It just has a lifespan. Okay, so that's, that's pretty much it. Um, now what I'm going to do, oh, at the bottom here, I have, uh, because this is a lot to do, right? None of it is particularly complex or difficult, but there is a lot of programming that goes into making a game. And some things in the, in the game engine, in order for them to work, they depend on other things working first. So I'm going to go over the code now, and then I'll come back to this, because you need to have seen the code in order to kind of uh, appreciate this. But what this is, is the order that I believe you should implement the assignment in. Because the order that I've presented things in here, whenever you complete a line, um, it relies on things that are above it, but it doesn't rely on anything that's below it. So if you do it in this order, you can implement one thing and test it to see if it works. Then you implement the, set, the, the next thing and test it to see if it works. Then implement the next thing and test it to see if it works. Don't implement the first six things and then go back and test because you don't know which step is broken. Okay, make sure this is like iterative, uh, iterated development here. So, um, like for example, it says, don't worry about the file, the config file reading until later once you get things working. Just hard code some stuff, get, get the things working. Then implement the VEC2 class. Why? Because literally everything uses the VEC2 class, right? And so if that's not working, nothing else will work. Um, so let's go over the code here and uh, I'll show you the files and I'll show you what they all do. So that's the bin directory. So you're going to be given this source directory. Let me close the config file uh, and I'll close the game file for now. So over here, what am I going to look at first? Let's look at the VEC2 class. The VEC2 class is a templated class. And as we saw before, you know, I specify the type name here and then X and Y are both of that given type. So if I want to declare um, a VEC2 that stores floats, I would do this, vec2 float v. Or I could have a vec2 of ints like this, right? So it's a templated class, which is how you want to store, how you want to design things like this, because if we hard coded it to be floats, what if we want to use doubles later on? Right now I have to write a new class rather than just making it templated. So I've got a default constructor here. Um, C++ likes to know I could leave a blank constructor, but by saying vec2, so the default constructor is actually equal to default. That's a thing that C++ does to tell the compiler explicitly, use the default constructor. Then I've got a constructor here which takes in uh, a T. So if it was a float, this will be a float, and it sets those internal variables. So that's the constructor you're going to be using most of the time. Next, what, what I have is a VEC2 constructor that takes in a, an SFML vector. So if I do have something like position from SFML, I can pass that directly into the constructor of a VEC2 rather than having to specify it element by element. So this is a little convenience func uh, functionality here. And I've implemented this for you. This is another convenience factor, which is an automatic conversion from a VEC2 to an SF vector2. Why? Because now, let's say I want to call set position on my circle shape. If I call set position with a vec2, it can just work. Because this, the, the compiler will see, okay, set position in SFML is expecting an SF vector2f. But they've passed in their custom vec2 class. Does that class specify any way to convert it from itself to an SF vector2? And it does. So we don't have to convert, annoyingly, from a VEC2 to an SF Vector2. It'll just do that for us. So that's, that's a little uh, convenience function there. So all of this has been implemented for you, except all the different operators. So plus, minus, divide, multiply, minus equals, times equals, plus equals, dist, etc. Um, all of these you need to implement yourself. Right? So if the very first thing you do is create two vectors and try and add them together, 
um, you're just going to get zero as the result. So the very first thing to do is to come in here to the vec2 class, edit that, put in all the functionality, and then just in main.cpp, just add two vectors together, see if you get the right result. Divide one vector by another, see if you get the right result, etc. And then down at the very bottom, I've specified this, which will um, make things a little bit easier in the assignment. So instead of having to type vec2 of a float, I've just made this define here, well, not a true define, but a using um, type def, where whenever we type vec2f, uh, that'll be a little shortcut to typing out vec2 float. So we're going to be using vec2fs everywhere in the assignment. So that's the vec2 class. Next, we have the components class. And rather, because we have a bunch of different components, rather than have one file for each component, I've put them all into um, one file for us, just because it's, it's way easier. And you may see here, um, I talked before in the C++ lecture about splitting classes into .h and .cpp. So you have a header file and then an implementation file. And I also mentioned that another possibility is a .hpp file. And what that is, it's a header file that also contains all the functionality. And the reason I've, I've included a bunch of HPP files here is essentially whenever your class is really dead simple, like a vec2, or like an entity, or like a component, it's probably better to just include everything in the header file. Because you don't want to have to have two files there's no, like also all of these functions when you declare everything in the header file, these are all going to be inlined, which is a, which is another thing in the compiler, a little more optimization. And so here, our major classes like the game game engine, that's going to have a header and a CPP file, but all of our other um, simpler classes are going to be in HPP files. And that's just, it's nice for the assignment because you don't need to be tabbing back and forth between a bunch of things. So all the components are listed here. Here is the base class component. Um, and so this has the exists variable. So that is whether or not an entity contains that. Um, we have the transform component, which has a position, a velocity, and an angle. And so in the rendering function, you're just going to increase this angle a little bit. And then when you have your circle shape, you're going to set the angle to this angle, and then your shape will rotate. That's the transform component. Um, here is the circle, or the shape component. And the shape component is just going to store a circle shape. Now, this is one of the exceptions to where I said that there was no logic in the components. We do have a little bit of logic here. We just take all of these inputs, we construct the circle, and then we fill out those things, right? So we just have a little bit of logic to do that. And here is the important part, this set origin. So this is the only thing that we don't know yet. And so what set origin does, as I mentioned before, if you have any shape in SFML, like this circle shape, by default, the position of this circle shape is right here. It's in the top left. We can specify where we want the position to actually be by setting the origin in that shape. And so by default, the origin is at 0, 0, which is the top left. And so the, the, if you do not set an origin, then your shape's position will be determined by the top left corner. But we want, because it makes all the math easier, we want our circle shape's position to be in the center. So what I do is I just take the radius, because the radius is this, Right? It's the, and the radius in the x and the radius in the y gives us the center of the circle. So over here in the code, if I say set origin radius radius, what that does is it sets it so that the position of the circle is denoted by the center of the circle instead of the top left of the circle. And this works for all types of shapes, not just circles. But in this assignment in particular, it will be very convenient to do that. Uh, we have a collision component, which just has a radius. Uh, we have a score component, which just has an integer score. We have a lifespan component that has two variables. One is the amount of lifespan that's remaining, but we also want to know how long it originally had to live in order to set that alpha channel. right? So we have two variables here. And then we have an input component that we're going to attach to the player, 
And what we're going to do is in the input system, we're going to set these variables. So if I detect someone press the W key, I'm going to set up to true because I should be moving up right now. If I've uh, pressed the um, left mouse button, then shoot is going to be set to true, okay? And that's it for the components. So you don't have to do anything to the components except your special weapon, I do want you to include a new component here. Right? So maybe a cooldown or some, something that you have to do that, well, the cooldown doesn't need to be a component, but you need to add some component. Here's how you would do that. Let's say I want to have a new component, then I will just take this, I will copy it, and I will paste it, and this is my Dave component. Right? So the Dave component does something. It, it talks to you for an hour and a half, right? Um, so I'll take this, I'll rename these, Oops, what am I doing here? Control. Why is it copying the whole thing? Okay, there we go. Yeah, so I have to change the constructor names as well. So now I've got my new component. I'm gonna, you know, change score to whatever. The only other thing you need to do is over here in the entity class, which we'll look at next, in order to make sure that our entity class is now holding your new component, you just have to add it to the component tuple, okay? And now your component is like registered in the entity or whatever. So that's all you have to do is just is add a new component and then make sure you're adding it to the component tuple. If you don't add it to the component tuple and you try and get or set that component, the compiler will yell something interesting at you. Does that mean that even enemies will have a C Dave component now when you add that to the component tuple? Well, one of the downfalls of storing things in the entity is that every entity will have a defaulted constructed version of every component. It's just that if we haven't added it yet, we don't consider it as actually having it. So the data of a default constructed C Dave, yes, will be in everything. But if the, if, if the exists variable is not set properly, then it is not actually considered to be there. So for a bigger game with a lot more components and entities, we probably wouldn't put every type of component in the component level. No, you'd use a memory pool. And then you have this giant storage area where all the components are stored, and entities wouldn't store any of that data. Not even your stuff like transforming? Or Nothing. Transform? We'll get to that. <laughs> we have a whole other lecture on that. Yeah, the point being, this is not the way you would make a AAA game. But this is way, way faster than we need for the games we're making in this course. Yeah. Uh, so here's the entity, uh, the entity class. It is a friend of Entity Manager. And what declaring friend of Entity Manager does is it allows its friend to, to access its privates, right? And the private that we are interested in accessing is the constructor. So the Entity class has a private constructor. That means the only thing that can construct entities is the Entity Manager. And down here, we've got all the functions that we talked about before. So I don't need to go over those because all of those were described. So entity is fully implemented for you. You don't need to do anything with entity. You just have to add your own component to the tuple. That being done, let's look at the entity manager class. So the entity manager class does have a couple of to-do things. Uh, so over here, I've said that entity vec is equal to this. Okay, so a standard vector of shared pointers to entity. So entity manager, we've gone all, uh, over all of this, but one thing that you do have to implement is this function. This function is called remove dead entities. What you have to do is it inputs a vector of a bunch of entities. Some of them may have their alive status uh, set to false. And what you have to do is check all of them and remove the ones that have the alive status set to false. And I, I mentioned last time that there's some, it's kind of confusing syntax, but the, the STL has, has code for this in C++, standard remove if. So you can say standard, hey, remove all the things if their alive is false, right? Or you can go through and write your own custom iterator. It doesn't matter, matter how you do it. And then we're going to use this function down here in the update function. And again, you're going to implement all of this yourself for this assignment to see how it works. And then in future assignments, I'll give you a working version of it. So the first thing that you have to do down here is um, 
add the entities from entities to add to the property proper locations and then you so you add them to the vector of all entities then you add them to the vector inside the appropriate map then you remove the dead entities from the ent the vector of all entities then you iterate over all of the entity vectors in the entity map and also remove the dead entities from each of those right so for example if i had an enemy that died I can't just remove it from the vector of all entities. I have to also remove it from the vector of all enemy entities. And so that's what this does here. But if you've written this function correctly, they both just take in entity vex, and so it will work for both of them. So I've written this loop for you, and I've written this for you, so you don't need to worry about where you need to call the deletion. I've already called it. You just need to implement um, the remove dead entities function. That's it. Uh, and everything down here has been implemented for you. So just the update function and the remove dead entities is what you need to do inside Entity Manager. Um, so for example, down here, add entity, all that's been done. It correctly adds things to the proper maps, etc. So that's the Entity Manager. Uh, what other files do we have here? Okay, so it's just the game class. So the game class over here has a bunch of different functions, a bunch of different variables. Um, all of those are pretty intuitively named, so I don't need to go through every single variable here. Um, but we are going to go through the code, so I show you what you need to do. So let's just start at the top. Um, in the init function, that's where you're going to read the config file. Okay. Now, you might say, oh, geez, we have to read in a bunch of stuff from that config file, right? There are like 30 variables in the config file. It's pretty, it's pretty intense. So what I've done, as a little help here, is over in game.h, I've specified a few structs for you. And a struct is essentially just a class that has only public variables. So you have a player config, an enemy config, and a bullet config. Each of those have associated private member variables in the game class. And so what you can do is as you read the shape radius of the player, you can just read that into playerconfig.sr. The collision radius, playerconfig.this. So over here, let's say, um, just to give you a better example of that, uh, inside game, if I'm reading and I've got my uh, file input stream, I can just say, okay, I know right now I should be uh, reading into a particular part of the player config. So this is m underscore player config dot sr. And I know the next one is m player config dot uh, cr, et cetera, et cetera. So I've created all those variables for you, so you don't need to make 30 new variables. And that's just a way. And then later on, when you go to actually spawn the player, you'll be reading from those variables that you've read all the values into. Okay, that's what that is. Um, next, you're going to set up the um, window with the parameters that have been read in from the configuration file. So these are just some defaults, um, the skeleton code. Oh, by the way, I should probably show this. Um, when you are given, oops. When you're, oh no, that's not, is it A1? Oh, I've called it A1, but it's actually A2. This is what you get when you uh, get the assignment for the first time. You get a blank UI, and you get a circle that just goes from the top left to the bottom right. So that, that's all that, that's given to you, but there is a significant amount of um, skeleton code that does that. Then this uh, sets up IM GUI, it scales it so it's a little bit bigger, you can comment that out if you want, and then it spawns a player. That's it. Um, now here, what I have is a helper function because you're going to be referring to the player a lot, right? The player variable. Where's the player variable stored? Well, it's somewhere in the entity manager. So what I do is I say, okay, entity manager, give me all the players and then take the first element of that vector. So wherever I want to refer to the player, I've just got a helper function here for you. So you say player bracket bracket and that gets you the player. Um, entity. All right, so the main loop 
is implemented in this run function. So if I go over here to main.cpp, look at the main.cpp. Isn't that so clean, right? I've just got a new game with a config file, and then I run the game. Couldn't be simpler. That's why we use um, classes like this. So over here, um, what this does is it first updates the entity manager. Then there's a required call to IAM GUI, so just ignore that. Then it calls all of our systems in order with rendering at the, at the end. And then I increment the current frame. Maybe you know you want to draw the frames per second or something like that. You need the frame count. So, uh, oh, the, the frame count is necessary for the spawning of enemies as well. So what you have to do here is to add the pause functionality. So over in uh, game.h, there's this paused variable. And if it's paused, you're going to do something like, hey, if it's paused, stop the enemy spawning. If it's paused, don't, don't do this thing. right? So you do that, that logic for that. Um, next, we have the spawn player function. I have a sample spawn player function with a bunch of hard-coded values. But of course, you are going to change this so that it reads in the variables from the config file. So I say, all right, entity manager, give me a new entity called player. Then add a transform component to that, add a shape component to that, and then add an input component to that. Okay, so this is all just sample code, so you can get used to this um, uh, way of working with the entities. Um, the spawn enemy function is here. So what this is going to do is, if you detect that an enemy should be spawned, because the interval has come up, you're going to call this function. And so make sure, what you can do is, like, you can come up here and copy and paste the entity code down here and edit it. But you're going to spawn an entity here with the proper values from the configuration file. And then, as a little hint here, because you have to spawn enemies at a certain interval, what I do here is I record the last time you spawned an enemy. Right? And so if I've recorded the last time I spawned an enemy, whenever I see that, okay, the current time is equal to the last time I spawned it plus the interval time, then I'm going to spawn another enemy. So that's one way of doing that. Here is the spawn small enemies function. And this is going to take in a, an entity as a parameter. And the entity that it takes in is going to be the entity that died in order for these small enemies to live. Right? And the reason for that is because the small enemy has to have the same color and the same amount of sides as the original entity. So that's why I pass it in as a, as a parameter. So we're going to spawn the small enemies here. When we create a smaller enemy, we have to read the values of the original enemy. So spawn a number of small enemies equal to the vertices of the original one. Set each small enemy to the same color, and the small enemies are worth double the points. Next, we have spawn bullet. That's going to take in two parameters. So whenever I spawn a bullet, I want it to spawn at the player's location. So typically, you'll be passing the player in for this entity, as well as a target. And that target is where you clicked with the mouse. And so this function is going to calculate, essentially, the velocity vector of how that bullet should be traveling, and then create that bullet and add it to the entity manager. The next one is completely up to you. So this is spawn special weapon. And I've given this a parameter of an entity because you may want to pass in the player um, as a parameter to that function. Next is the movement function. And what you have to do in the movement function, essentially, is um, update all of the entities so that their velocity gets added to their position. As a simple example, what I've done here is I get the transform of the player. Now, you might say, why did I get a reference to the transform? Because if I just say auto transform, if I just get the transform and store it as a variable, it copies that into the local variable. And so I need a reference to say, hey, when I'm modifying transform, I want it to actually modify the transform that lives in the entity. So that's why it's a reference. And so what you might do in some of these functions, you might be referring to the player's transform component like 10 times in, in the collision code or something like that. So what I would recommend is setting up maybe a variable like this just to make it a bit easier. So you're not calling player get C transform every single time you want to refer to the transform. So what I've done here just for the, um, the example code, because this, yeah, that player does move down and to the right. But 
the reason I've individually added the components of the velocity to the position is because the VEC2 class hasn't been implemented yet, right? But what you will do here is you can say um, transform dot pause plus equals transform dot velocity. So that is what you can do once you've implemented that functionality in the VEC2 class, and it becomes really easy. And anything else that you want to, that is related to movement in the game, you can put in the movement class. Here is the, uh, the lifespan class, that is the, the lifespan system. That's where you, um, you do everything related to lifespan. I don't need to repeat all of that again. Here is the collision system. So you're going to implement all the proper collisions between entities, and you can do code that's just like the code that we had in the slides. So you can say for um, auto b in m entities dot get entities bullet. So this will give me all the bullets. And then in here I can say for auto e m entities dot get entities enemy. Okay. And in here, now I have access, I have the entity, so I can get the transform, and I can get the collision radius, and I can detect that collision in there. Now just keep in mind that it may be advantageous to you to call the big enemies enemies, and the small enemies something different, because their behavior is different a little bit, right? So if you do that, I can still shoot the small enemies, so I may have to duplicate this code. Um, so down here, I would say, okay, uh, I would have the same thing, but maybe for small enemies. Right? So I'm still looping over the bullets, but now I'm checking, okay, what, does, what happens when a bullet hits a small enemy as well? And you also have to check um, for every enemy, does the player collide with it, etc. So all the functionality of collisions. In here, this is the enemy spawner. So like I said, what you're doing is you're checking to see when was the last time I spawned an enemy. If the amount of frames that I've specified has passed since the last time I spawned an enemy, then call spawn enemy. So that's, that's really all that this function does. And make sure, make sure that this doesn't tick while the game is paused, etc. Um, I have put in a GUI system. So this will just, this is where you write your GUI code rather than putting it all inside main. I have its own function here. And then um, the rendering system, you are going to write it for this assignment. And then in future assignments, I'll be doing the rendering for you. I just want you to do it once. So what this does, it clears the window. It gets the shape of the um, player. And it sets the position of that shape to the transform position of that shape, right? Because the, the transform component position actually lives in a different spot in memory than the SFML circle shapes position. So every frame when you go to render it, you just have to make sure that you set the position of the player or all the enemies to where they should actually be. Then what I do here, just as an example, I uh, set the angle and rotate it a little bit. Then I draw the player's circle. So what you have to do here is that this is hard coded to only draw the player. You can pretty much just write a for loop here looping over all the entities, change player to that entity, and it, it'll just work, right? So this is pretty, pretty simple. Um, you just have to make sure that that renders for all the entities. And the last thing here is the user input. And so the user input, um, essentially, whenever you detect that the correct key has been hit, you are going to do the thing that is required for that, okay? Now, typically in games, we don't want the actions that are performed in games, such as moving up, down, left, right, etc., to be done like inside strict user input handling code like this. And we'll deal with that in a future assignment. But for now, it's OK. But here's the thing. You will lose marks if you are doing things like modifying the position of the, of the player in this code. So what should happen is that the user input is only user input code. That's why it's the user input system. So if I press W, it's going to set the input component up. Oh, this is key released. OK, this is key press. So there's key press and release. When it's pressed, I set what it should be doing to true. 
when it's released, I set what it should be doing to false. Now up here in the movement system, what I'm doing here is I'm reading the input component and saying, hey, should the player be moving up? If so, the movement system is where I'm actually adding the velocity to the player. Okay, so all the input system does is detect that the buttons have been pressed and set the variables, variables properly. That's it, okay? Um, the, the other thing that you can do here is in this assignment, um, the spawn bullet function, that you can do here. So if I detect um, mouse button pressed, right? So I detect mouse left, I've given you sample code for where the mouse was pressed within the window, call spawn bullet here. Okay, so you can call that there, that's fine, because it's just much easier. In the future, we'll see how that um, should be done properly. Now, if I very quickly, I know I'm a little bit over time, I just, you can leave if you want, I just want to go over this uh, pretty quickly. The marks file is there, um, but at the bottom is just the hints. I recommend, first, um, don't worry about the configuration file until you've gotten a few things working. Implement the VEC2 class first. That's the most important thing, because none of the math will work. It'll all be zeros until you implement VEC2. Then implement some basic functionality of the Entity Manager class, so the Add Entity and Update functions. Um, implement the basics of the Game class, right? So construct a player, implement basic drawing, and uh, then implement player movement. Then implement the uh, Entity Manager update function and the get entities function so that you can actually loop through stuff. Up here, I have said implement add entity. I think I've given you add entity in this assignment. So if it says to do something that's already there, don't worry about it. Um, implement the collisions, then implement the rest of the games functionality. And the, the GUI functionality, you can do that whenever you want. If you save it till the end, that's fine. Doesn't really matter to me. But I will tell you that if you implement the GUI functionality sooner, then it may help you to debug um, your program. And, like if you have a list of all the entities that you can delete and see where they are and stuff, or turn off individual systems, that may actually help with the rest of the development. So do the UI stuff whenever you want, but just keep in mind that it, uh, it could help.